you bless our lives. We thank you uh, for the weather. We thank you for uh, all the things that you've given us. And Lord, we pray many thanks for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, because without him, we would be a hopeless and helpless society and group of people. And Lord, we're all here today to lift him up and praise his name. We ask that you would indeed inhabit the praise of our lips. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Let's greet one another. Well, good morning. How are you? <laughs> that tree for the program plugs in, but I've got the cord for the piano right now. This tree. I need a cord for it. Okay, if you'll stand with me, good morning. This morning we're all here today, a little lopsided. We need to spread some of this out. We're going to do glory to His name. Down at the cross where my Savior died. the blood of life. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood
seated. I come into your presence past the gates of praise into your sanctuary where I'm standing face to face I look upon your countenance I see the glory on each face and I can only bow down you are awesome in this place, mighty God. Sing with me. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father.
In 2006, union, there was a Union University article speaking of Ted Koppel's leaving ABC's Nightline, and it states, Koppel, at that time, 65, has now signed a three-year contract to produce programs for the Discovery Cable Channel. Speaking of his decisions to go to Discovery rather than a news channel, Koppel stated that his decision was motivated by an understanding that news channels often tend to focus more on what is recent rather than what is important. A typically Koppel-esque statement, it is one that should cause Christians, this is the article continuing, that should cause Christians everywhere to consider their own approach to news. More importantly, it is a statement that should call, cause Christians to reflect on their faith, their, command, their commitment to it, and their expressions of it. With all of history in the past, modern American evangelicals are often tempted to be overly preoccupied with what is simply recent rather than what is essentially important. Often church folks are distracted by the siren sounds of the latest religious whiz-bang novelty while failing to keep the essential and foundational elements of the faith in the right place. Out with the old and in with the new seems to be the theme of many who are setting up coffee shops in their church foyers, feasting on topical sermons, and shunning doctrine all to the glory of god of course the obsession with the recent rather than the important has many church leaders thinking strategically and planning carefully concerning what people want to experience when they come to church however a better question to ask is what will those who come to church this sunday take home with them you know, these ideas are, uh, we see that happening more and more every day where we get caught up in this whole idea of uh, trying to uh, make church more entertainment than, than actually preaching and teaching about the Word of God. And a lot of times we see that in the rejection of uh Bible study and, and in the rejection of things because it's just not fun enough. It's just not fun enough to go. And, and I want to I'm gonna talk to you today and, and in this message I want us to understand that there are some terms that I'm going to mention now. You, some of you may know them, some of you may not. That's okay. I'm going to explain them. But <clears throat> But I want us to understand something. It's kind of like I told the men's Bible study class today. We're not six-year-olds. We're not 12-year-olds, at least for the adults. We're adults, and it's time to stop acting like we're six- and 12-year-olds, and it's time to get in to the meat of the Word of God. And what that means is we have to stop intentionally being ignorant and stupid about the Word of God. We need to educate ourselves. That's part of what the church does. The call of the church is to equip the saints, but there's also things that we can do on our own. Whatever that is, we need to take forward, and this is the warning that I want to give you. Don't think the enemy doesn't already know your doctrine. Don't think that the people who are out there speaking against the church don't already have bullet points 
that they're speaking against because they are equipped. They're indoctrinated at a young age. And I know a lot of people just take, for instance, and I, you know, if I offend you, that's just the way it is. But, uh, you know, Mormonism, those kids are raised to know that they're going to go on a mission trip when they're 18 years old and they go into all parts of the world with a suit and a bicycle and the Book of Mormon and they are killed and murdered and it does not dissuade a one of them to go on that mission trip. And I want us to understand that so many times, I, I tell you, I, I had <clears throat> a, uh, I've shared this experience with you before. I've had the experience where we had one of the uh, Jehovah's Witness come by when we lived in Maybank. <clears throat> and uh, this, these two girls came by. They couldn't have been, you know, they had to be in middle school. And uh, they come by, and they were going to hand out the deal. So I opened the door, and, you know, hey, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so they started talking, and I, and, and I said, <coughs> um, you know, I asked them, I said, well, let me ask you a question. You know, and this was uh, the verses on our Bible study to get today. It was, uh, I asked them, I said, you know, in the Gospel of John, um, it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and y'all don't believe that Jesus was God. And without hesitation, this couldn't have been more than a 13-year-old girl, looked at me and said, well, if you look at the original Greek, there is something that is implied, and began to talk to me about Greek grammar at 13 years old. I would dare say most men in the church would have gone, well, I don't know about all that, but I'm going to tell you, Jesus loves you, you know, and, and been ill-equipped. And why? Why? I, I'll tell you what, I, I looked at that girl and I said, oh, you know the Greek. I know it too. Let's talk about what you're talking about in the indefinite article. And, and within, and as soon as I said that, she said, we got, the other girl says, we got to go. <laughs> you know? But I want you to know, they were there, and they were ready. And folks, there are people, it's already happening today, and most of us don't realize it, but there is an indoctrination that goes on today and, and we don't even realize it's happening. But you see, rather than just us focusing on what's cool and what's neat or how we can entertain so we can make sure that people come in these doors, and you know what? Hey, we do practice. There is a, you know, we want to get it right level, you know, when we practice and rehearse in the choir or when I go over my sermon, I go over it, you know, hopefully to eliminate all the mistakes I'm going to make. And I, if I get one or two out, you know, I'm good with that, you know, but the rest of them y'all just have to live with. But, but what we're going to look at is the fact that there is a basis of belief in the Word of God. And we have to understand that and become well-grounded and well-versed in that. If we don't know what our own beliefs are, how will we ever recognize something that is false? Most of those beliefs that are arguments against us are only dust level deep and as soon as you start blowing them away you clear them out of the way the arguments are are impotent but you know what 
there are so many Christians who their knowledge and, and their skill set in doing any of this is only, it's not even dust level deep. Christians get blown away easier than non-Christians do who are indoctrinated even in the Christian doctrines with counterpoints. So we're going to begin today with one of the major assertions that the Bible puts forth. I'm going to ask you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Deuteronomy. And we're going to be looking in the fifth chapter and beginning in the fifth verse. We're going to be reading two verses, or uh, six ver yeah, six verse, verses six through seven. I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for the fact that you say you inhabit the praise of our lips, and I pray many thanks for our choir, for our church, for all of those who are engaged in praising you uh, in song this morning, for all those who were. Lord, I pray for those who, uh, for whatever reason, could not praise you. I pray that you would speak to their hearts, that you would change things in their life so that they could praise you. Even if it's just their own attitudes and their own way of thinking, Lord, change that today. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. As we begin to look at that, and this is one of the terms we're going to introduce, the first commandment here asserts monotheism. Now, I want us to understand that these are terms that are technical terms, but you will see them in writings and such by editors and newspapers, and you will see them by people who criticize the Christian faith. So theism simply means the belief in God. The belief in God. And, and the mono means only one. So monotheism is a belief in only one God. That's all that means. It's not overly complicated. It's not something that is, you know, <clears throat> dictionary-wise using a bunch of complicated terms. It is just a term that means I believe in only one God. Right? Later on, in, when we get to verse 6 in Deuteronomy, or chapter 6 in Deuteronomy, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? So we believe... There is only one God, one and only one God. But when we look around, we see that there are beliefs in other gods. Now, we could take all of the false religions, right? All the ones that have been around for centuries, that, you know, the old religions, and we can name those. You know, we can... Go through Hinduism, Islam, uh, Buddhism, uh, any, any of those like that. But today, there's, there are modern gods, and there are modern religions. They don't call themselves religions. A lot of times, they call themselves science. But I want you to understand they have doctrines or they have teachings of what they call truth. So in essence, they have modern theologies. Now, I'm not talking about theologies associated with Christian theology. I'm talking about they have their own theologies with their own God. For instance... How many of you have heard, well, someone's got mental illness, so that problem isn't uh, a problem that the church can handle. They have to go to psychologists or psychiatrists. Have you heard that before? That the Word of God can't help someone because they're mentally ill? Or have you heard that, you know, hey, 
<clears throat> the way to fix criminals and preteen pregnancy is to just educate them? Have you heard that? There are beliefs out there that want to push away the very Word of God. <clears throat> and these false gods, you see, they don't claim to be omnip omnipotent or, or all-powerful. They're just a little bit stronger than we are. They don't claim to be all-knowing or omniscient. They're just a little bit more knowledgeable than we are. Right? And, and in so doing, right, they become gods. Abortion is one of those things, right? If, if a woman becomes pregnant, and decides she doesn't want to have that child, she gets to choose whether or not that child lives or dies. However, if she is pregnant and wants to keep the child and someone causes her to lose that child and miscarry, that person is guilty of murder. So what does that make the woman? God. That woman is God over the life of that child. She says, my body, my choice. And she's including the child. That is a theology. That means that child has no worth no value unless she decides to assign that. There are these false gods, but they don't hold up to the biblical standard. You see, the, the God of the Bible is omnipotent. That means he is all-powerful. And this list goes back to <clears throat> kind of what Adrian was talking about last week in, in that the list itself is infinite. But you, you could go through and say, okay, he's omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnipresent. That means he's, there's no place that exists that is a place that he's not aware of. That his power, his knowledge, all of his characters can't go to that place or, or be aware of that place. He is self-defining. He, he lets us know who he is. He is self-existent. In other words, there is nothing that causes him to exist but himself. Now we read in Acts that our breath and our heartbeat actually comes from God. He is holy, he is just, we could say he's omni, omnibenevolent, he's all loving. All of these things, we could go on and on and on, and those are the standards that the Bible holds true. Are the standards that the Bible says, this is what, mean, this is what being a God is. And if we go back and, and we, we, we would refer or review the book of Exodus, which is a <clears throat> highly underrated book, it's overlooked, but in there we see God defining himself in a way that is unique but is also mighty and powerful. And how is it he does that? Remember, the children of Israel are in bondage. And he sends Moses and Aaron to go up to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Just the first thing that happens, right? Aaron throws the staff down. All the magicians are around there. They throw their staffs down. And his staff, and, and they all turn into snakes. But his snake 
eats all of the other snakes. What's he saying? My messengers are supreme to your messengers. Then he goes and has Moses turn the Nile into blood. Now for the Egyptians, the Nile was God. And what's he do? He says, hey, look, I tell this Nile what to do. And then immediately after that, he calls the frogs out of the Nile. And what happens is Pharaoh, everybody gets, you know, the magicians and <coughs> priests and all that finally tell Pharaoh, hey, let's get this thing shut down. And so he reaches out to Moses and God says, hey, it's going to happen at this time tomorrow. And what's he demonstrate? He's in control of the plagues. He can call a plague into place and a plague off. He is the one that's in charge. And you go through each of those ten things that he does and it demonstrates that he is the God and all of their other gods have no power against him. You see, God demonstrates himself over and over and over again <coughs> that he is the one and only true God. All of creation speaks about his creativity, his power, his eternity, day in, day out, in every language, in every place, is what the Bible says. It screams the existence of God. It communicates it wherever you go. Creation says there is an eternal, powerful God that is a creator. And what, do, what does man do? Man suppresses that. <clears throat> and we begin to look in this, and we understand that he says, when he says, I am the Lord your God, he's telling them, hey, there's only one of me, and there's one and only one of me. The second part, of the commandment that it tells us is it requires ultimate allegiance. It requires complete and total allegiance. What's it say after that? He says, I delivered you out of bondage from Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Who? You. No other gods. This isn't a God plus. There is one God and only one God, and we do not have any other gods that equal to or measure up to the God of the Bible. There is no, he's not a God on the totem pole where there are other gods. He is the only God. Even though people may identify things as gods, it still doesn't matter. He says, <clears throat> I am the only God and I demand your ultimate allegiance is what he's saying. He's, he's asserting, he is telling us that he expects us to be totally and completely committed to him. Why? Why would we think that? I mean, you know, that, <clears throat> you know, we could take that in a negative light and people do and say, man, I mean, that is just so narrow minded. That is just all this other stuff, you know. But it's not like he's not going to bless us when we do that, right? I mean, he's telling us things because, you know what? When I turn me into a God, guess what? Everything falls apart. You know, when, you, when each of us turn ourselves into God, everything falls apart. It doesn't build us up, it tears us down. But when we're all focused on the same God, on the one God, the only true God, 
then we're built up. And we give him priority and we see that he has blessed us because he is creator. He is the one and only God. And and I, the guy's name is like Herbert Schlossberger. He has a book he wrote in the, I think it was the 80s or 90s. It's called Idols for Destruction. And in that book, he talks about that people aren't just turning away from God. They turn away from God and turn to something else. It's not a, you know, I'm just not going to believe God exists. It's I'm going to, not only am I not going to believe God exists, but I'm going to believe this over here. And that's where the problem comes into. What, what <clears throat> begins to happen is because then who is defining that? Who's creating that, that set of beliefs, that, that those things that we call truth in that situation? It's us. Look at science. Man interprets science. How many times has he hit the nail on the head? I don't know, but he's created a lot of wire brushes. If you know what I mean. When men interpret science, there's a lot of bent nails out there. And yet we want to say that, well, you know, this is, I know this is what the Bible says, but this is what science says. Really? I mean, what did science say during COVID? How, how much of that was... I? You couldn't even figure out who was telling the truth and who wasn't. And it, and it became so politicized that, you know, I don't know, could kids go back to school? Do they have to wear a mask? You know, I don't know. It says kids don't get sick. Well, why do they have to wear a mask? Well, we want to protect them. Why? They don't get it. They don't get COVID. So why are we doing this? Well, it's what the science says. No, the science says they don't need to. You, know, you see what I'm saying? This is a real life example. And then on the other hand, you got the ones that are saying, oh yeah, all those sick elderly people, let's send them back into the nursing home. And then scratch their heads and wonder why all the other elderly people got sick. Why? Why did that get so misinterpreted and so mishandled? And I'm not, trust me, that's a local issue. That is not a single point of contact issue. That was mistakes that were being made all over this nation by people in charge all over this nation. But we see these things and we understand, you know, and we talk about, Evolution. Evolution is supposedly the truth. Have you ever just wondered about that? Then why aren't there all these different species that fill in the gaps? Why is that not happening today? Where are the different ones in there? And, and even if you go and look at the, the layers of the earth, why is there not this erosion layer that should exist at the level it should exist in between the different layers? You see, those are things that we should be able to identify and understand because our kids are being told a lie, and it is a lie. The state of Texas passed the law saying, hey, this is what's going to be taught. And you know what? It is a lie. We read that in the passage today in 1 John. Nothing that, nothing without Christ, nothing has been created that has been created. So in the beginning, when everything was created, it was created then.
And why is that hard for the Christian to believe? Unless you have another God. You see, the Bible explains these things, but, but we see, you know, the problem that we have is that it's so ambiguous. These definitions are so ambiguous. You know, the, the thing that the Jews had in their favor were there were distinct individual gods. There was Baal. There was a statue of Baal. You knew that was what you were fighting against. There was Artemis. There was a statue of Artemis. The Christians knew what they were fighting against. There were the Egyptian gods. All those had different, they even had temples to them, and they knew exactly what they were fighting against. But in this quagmire of ambiguity that we've come to, we have bottomed out in this definition of what truth is. And we can't understand why those truths are promulgated and, and carried on and taken forward over and over again. And I, I'll tell you why. It's because Christians are ignorant of the Word of God. We intentionally, you know... I want to ask you something. What's more important for them to learn math or for them to learn this? Now, I'm being serious. Now, I'm a, I'm a math guy. I love math. But I also grew up without this, and once I discovered this, there is nothing like it. The Word of God and an introduction into the Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. There is nothing like that in all the world. I spent my whole life, or my adult life, working, well, most of my adult life, working around IT type stuff, and which is math oriented, very logic oriented, all of that. And, and, and man, I just, you know, there were times, now the jobs I didn't necessarily care for, but, but the idea of I was comfortable in it. I remember taking the ASVAB, getting into the military. I knew formulas so that if they could give me formulas, I could answer any question as long as there was a formula that I could apply to it. But there's nothing that has helped me more than the Word of God and my relationship with God. Nothing. While I was doing all that, I was doing other things. But nothing, nothing impacted me like this, like getting to know God. And my commitment and our commitment, and I'm sure that's the same. I, I'm sure everybody would say that. But our commitment has to be an ultimate allegiance to him because there is no other. And we have to understand what the Bible teaches because, again, if we don't, trust me, we will fall into the trap exclusive. The only way to the Father, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Now you either believe that or you don't. And oftentimes when we get into these things, we begin to look at them and we begin to say, hey, look, <clears throat> you know, I'm being challenged here by whatever. I got an, I got an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God. And if those people are going to respond positively to the gospel, it's going to get presented to them. Now, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to, I'm going to give my time to do it around here. I'm going to give my money so that it's carried out for those people who are taking the message globally. 
<clears throat> and I'm going to do my part to make sure that that message gets pushed out to wherever it is. But I want to tell you that those people who reject Christ, who hear the message and reject Christ, aren't going to heaven. It's what it says. I don't get to cherry pick what I believe and what I don't believe in here. But if we believe, and, and I want to tell you, in practice, we practice universalism, a lot of us do. Right? person never admits to, to being a Christian, has, has a life that's obviously not a Christian life, has never darkened the doorstep of a church except maybe to attend a funeral, and they die, and why do we all say, well, we'll see them in heaven? Why do we say that? Do we really believe that? Because if you do, that's not what it says here. It says there's one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Jesus Christ. I don't mean you go to a funeral and go, wow, he's going to hell, you know. No, we don't do that. <sighs> but we make an effort to witness and to share the gospel because there is only one way. And you know what? My Jesus is big enough and his sacrifice was sufficient enough to cover the sins of everybody. There's no limit on it. We didn't get a lottery ticket and only the green ones are, get to be covered. Right? Everybody... Everybody who confesses him, who believes in their heart and confesses him, everybody can be saved. The reality is not everybody believes. Not everybody does. That's their choice. But the one thing that we must know and that we must hold near and dear to our heart, and that is this first command, and it says, you shall have no other gods before me. And folks, we put, we, we have to take that, that's the first command. For Christians, what you know, he's telling the Jews, I am the guy who delivered you from the bondage of the Egyptians. And what can he say to us? I am the God who delivered you from the domain of death and the bondage of sin. You shall have no other gods before me. That's how we as Christians ought to look at it. And we should say, you know what? There is one and only one way to heaven and that is in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus deserves, because of what He did for me, He deserves everything that I am. My ultimate allegiance, all my possessions, all that I am, all that I will be, belong to Jesus Christ. And thirdly, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. Because when we say these other things, we're witnessing to other people and we're condemning them to a eternal hell. There is one way, only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Now, you know, our thing is monotheism, but the Christian, there is a the difference between East and West. One of the main differences between East and West is the view of the Trinity. The Eastern Orthodox churches and the Western churches, it's the view of the Trinity. And we even see that in some denominations today. We believe there's one nature, one essence, who manifest themselves in three distinct and individual 
personalities. We believe that God manifests himself as the Father. And that is a distinct person slash personality. He also manifests himself as the Son of God, which is in Bible study today, it says in the beginning the Word was with, was with God. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. So Jesus is God and was also with the Father eternally. And we believe in the Holy Spirit that works in us. He is the comforter. He convicts us of sin and of righteousness. He indwells the believer. He empowers the believer. Jesus redeemed us. The Holy Spirit regenerates us and sanctifies us, or in other words, matures us and guides us in our walk as Christians. The Father is not the Son, nor is He the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father, nor is He the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son, nor is He the Father. But they are all of the same nature, and yes, there's a part of that that we don't comprehend because our minds are just incapable of comprehending that. But I, I want you to understand... that there is let me see if I can find this one well it was a guy from the latter part of the last century and he wrote that the problem the single biggest problem that the the world faces is the problem of a monotheistic God. This is a literary God guy that, that wrote this. He was a contributor, one of the main contributors to the whole, you know, in, in the intellectual movement. And he says the problem, and, and that God exists because of an ancient book that came forth in the Bronze Age and it produced three different religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Muslim. And the God they worship is a sky God. And he goes on to describe in a mocking way this, the, these things that we say, how we are, are to, in total commitment to him and all this, but he does so in a mocking way. And he says that is the leading problem facing the society of today. And I want us to understand that this idea of monotheism is in, in a Trinitarian monotheism is imperative as we move forward and we bear the scandal of the cross. You see, we have to go forward and we have to be able to articulate these things and speak to these things because we understand they are true. It is not whoever is in Congress or has power in Congress. It's not whoever has power in the Senate or how many seats you know, are in the Supreme Court, liberal or to the left or to the right, liberal or conservative, or even who the president is. It's in the footprints of the people living in this society that will determine the fate of this nation because God will either judge us as being faithful or judge us as being wrong and he will and he will rain down his wrath if we're wrong and rain down his blessings if we're right we can go through all of these things about what causes this and what causes that but you know what it is the one and only one 
true God that manipulates humanity. I'm not saying we shouldn't be part of the political process. What I'm saying is, in addition to being part of the political process, our first priority ought to be our own lives and how we worship and who we worship. Because what we worship will be revealed in the way we live our lives. We're not, I'm going to tell you, if you kept yourself ignorant of the Word of God, it's time to change. It's time to change. There's nothing more important to you, whether you realize it or not, there's nothing more important in your life than understanding, rightly understanding, the God of the Bible. And, and just as a kind of a, a, a understanding of, of what Deuteronomy 6 and all that, when he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your mind. You know what that means? We should be in a love affair with God. That should be our primary relationship, our primary obedience. Everything about that we should be fully engaged in and we should be looking at promoting the things He wants us to promote and stand with Him and His truth. Because when we don't, little innocent babies don't survive. When we don't, children are chemically modified. And that just is another one that just totally blows my mind. I can't even comprehend how that is even a thought in a reasonable person's mind. But that's where we are. We have to know our truths so that we can identify when other Theologies are presented as truth when in fact they're a lie. Now you may be a Christian and you may have been sitting on that stump of ignorance for a long time and you decide, you know what, it's time for me to get off. It's time for me to get engaged and to become a true disciple, and, and work on my maturity as a believer. It's time for me to do that. You may be a non-Christian, and, and you may be saying, you know what, I've never given any sort of thought to the only one and true God, but today I want to do that. Today I want to receive His Son as my Lord and Savior. The body, the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. It also says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so with that, we put a prayer up here. It's a simple prayer of something you might say. You can use those words. You can use the words that if you have your own words, you can use those words. But the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It states it as a truth, not as a maybe situation. So if we repent, if we stop chasing after these other gods, and we turn to, we turn from the false gods, and turn to the true God and receive what His Son has done for us by faith. When Jesus died on the cross, we will be saved. That's what the Bible says. It asserts that as truth. Today, you can be saved. Today, you can rededicate your life 
and you can say, you know what? Instead of being drugged down the road, I'm going to run down the road. It's a time of decision that we get into right now. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to have work.